Hello and welcome to Console Shock, episode 46, Retro and Modern Gaming Chat with me, Trev and Stu. Hey guys. How's it going, Stu? Yeah, going really well, really well. I'm uh, 92% on Red Dead Redemption. Bloody hell. <laughs> you, you, you just put, so how many hours a day are you, you, are you playing? Uh, not, not that much, not that much. But 80%. <laughs> I almost want to, the problem is I've got no one to talk to about it because no one's as, as far as me into the game or... They're all saying, oh, I'll buy it after Christmas. So I can't talk to about the story with anyone. So I've got, I've got too many things to play. I've got, so I'll, I'll, I can't just sit and play the one game uh, for, forever until I can I, I've, got, I've got to focus on one game and that's it. I, I can't do two oh, can't games do at once or yeah. anything like that. I've got to do one game and that's done. I'll move I'm on like to the next scatty. one. I'm too scatty. Like mentally, mm. I'll play do a couple of missions in Red Dead, and I'll be like, "Oh God, I really want to play like my my career in FIFA." I'll jump over to that. Then I'm like, "Oh, I've got my um, I've got a GoTech in my Atari ST um, recently. Finally, after ages, I'm like, God, I want to load up a bunch of games and play that. Then that'll be a whole evening doing that. Um, then um, uh, another bit of news. We'll talk about it a bit later. The SD to SNES flash cart. Mm. You can now play Street Fighter Alpha 2 on that. They've updated the firmware, so that was mm. that this week. Uh, this is too too much bloody stuff to play. I'll get back to Red Dead, but um, and I've got Shadow of the Tomb Raider in a sale, uh, so uh, it's only 22 quid. So I started playing that. Got back into my Vita. Um, I've got the Ratchet and Clank trilogy, uh, so I want to play that. So yeah, I'm well, just uh, yeah. I, I, you know what? I wish I was like uh, not into any of this stuff. But I'm just the sort of what probably is like a normal. What, what I see is like a normal gamer is like. Someone that they just have the, they just have the modern console, whatever that is, and they just get the the one AAA game that's that's the, the game. It's that by FIFA play. and COD every year, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I've got friends that are like what I think are what I would consider to be mainstream sort of gamers, where they just have the latest console. They have no interest in old stuff. They they sell. They've got PS4 now. They got rid of PS3 the day uh, or a little bit after the PS4 came out. I have no interest now in those old games. Uh, they'll just get Assassin's Creed, they'll play that, that'll be the only game they'll play for a month, complete it, get the next one, card will come out, they'll play that, and that's it, they just go from AAA game, AAA game, current gen. They have no interest in any of the wider stuff, which is fine, that's probably how, that's kind of how the, the games industry expects everyone to be, I think. We're kind of weird, in a good way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're just these very oddball people that constantly go back to this old junk, uh, and keep playing it, and um, but yeah, it's um, I think we're a little bit we're a little bit weird at that. But well done, Stu, for playing w- one game for more for a, a lot. <laughs> it is a very good game, so it's anyway, easier as it like, Yeah, I was going to say we got a guest on tonight. I know we need we, we really should stop talking about us so much. I know we're, it's we're about us, us, us. <laughs> so we've got a guest on. It's been a long while since. We've had this particular person on. In fact, it was episode 14 two years ago. Can you believe that, Stu? I, I can't believe it. We've been doing it for so long. It's the 8th of December 2016. It was actually the last time we had this person on. So for big fans of the Retro Hour podcast, today we have back on the show... Is it Ravi? Is it Ravi? <laughs> Is he your favourite? My favourite guy, Ravi. Oh, damn, I'm sorry. But we've got the other... It's the other guy. It's the other oh, one, Dan. Oh, I'll settle for Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry well, to disappoint, guys. <laughs> uh, no problem. No problem, Dan. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for coming on. 
Yeah, hi Trent, dude. Thank you for inviting me back. I can't believe it's been two years. We were just chatting before we uh, started recording yeah. there. I thought it was about a year ago. It felt like it, didn't it? It was, yeah. also, it was episode 14 and this is 46. Oh, that's scary. That's we don't, lot, do, we don't do as many as you guys. We've still managed to creep up to nearly 50 somehow, though. I don't know how that happened. But yeah, I mean, God, I mean, you guys weren't even, I mean, how long have you been going? Three years now? So you were relatively sort yeah. of fresh back to two, two years ago. Yeah, it's our third anniversary of the podcast on the um, yeah, first week in January. So, yeah. Oh, my God. You're still getting people saying, uh, hey, I've just discovered your podcast. I've listened to all X amount of episodes in the last <laughs> 24 hours. Yeah, we, we had when some guy who was driving all the way across Europe who um, listened to about six months' worth of shows in a weekend. Oh, my God. Wow. He must have been here in his sleep. <laughs> I just can't imagine how you could, like, stitch all that together in one go. I can't. Is it in one or the other? The Vector Hour is excellent. I probably could do a marathon of it, but I'm not sure I could do all however many episodes you've got now um, in a short space of time. I think I've got to uh, got eat and sleep. Uh, <laughs> sorry well, that's that. one thing about podcasts, isn't it? You can you can kind of do other stuff while listening, I guess, like driving across Europe. So that's yeah, what advantage um, it has over video, I guess. Weird, a weird one that I, that I do, I don't know if uh, you guys have a similar habit, when it comes to a podcast, like uh, a lot, especially a long-form one, or, or like something like an LGR episode where you can kind of glance at it every now and then but you can mostly just have it on in the back because he's like you know he's built rebuilding his 486 pc or something um it's housework like if i'm cleaning the yeah. bathroom <laughs> you know stick my macbook somewhere where it's also not going to get wet or anything um and just play that and i could just have that in the background and it will just makes it a lot a, a lot easier to do with a bit of um you know lgr or 8-bit guy any of those you know someone tinkering with some old retro stuff like uh Ava Guy had a great one about his Apple II. Did you see that one, guys? Was that the black one that had the yeah. fan on the top? Yeah, that was the best bit, wasn't it? It had a huge hole in the top of the case. Yeah. And he it, and he had some guy that put like some liquid sort of plastic epoxy stuff that completely filled in that hole that he had to cut out. And uh and he and he completely looked uh, perfect. I can't mm. believe it. Yeah, I do love those long form videos as well. I'm kind of the same because I'll, I'll put a video on, for example, and then either be doing some work and have it on like my Chromecast on my TV or like you said, I'll be, you know, tidying up or making dinner or whatever. And you can't be bothered to go over and keep putting a new video on every like 10 minutes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah it's just a big, long, long form video. So I was watching um, Kim Justice's, you know, documentary about um, sensible software and the one she did about uh, Joff as well this week. That was really interesting. Yeah. Oh, exactly. I, I just finished that today. It, it was, he made some actually amazing games and, uh, I really, I'll be honest with you, I've got some real sort of lapses of knowledge about a lot of the sort of the old Spectrum encoders, but you could really see how those games looked so much better than everything else. Yeah. It's weird, yeah. I mean, um, one thing I always uh, do do with, um, well, like, I actually don't watch TV, I don't think. I, the only thing I really watch if, if I'm at a TV is, is YouTube. I put YouTube at app on. I don't watch, you know, any of the big TV shows. We used to watch Walking Dead a little bit um that's it to be honest uh, i mean my girlfriend watches everything under the sun but if i've got a spare if like the tv's free i'll tend to just put the put the, this a smart tv i'll put youtube on and i'll just watch mm. that on a tv it's because it's stuff i'm actually into because because you could hyper specialize in, in something no one on t on actual t commercial tv is making videos about turning a black apple II, uh restoring it back to you know health that's never going to be on, is it? That's what when people sort of talk about, uh, you know, oh, will they bring back Games Master? Will they bring back X or Y? I think they, they don't need to. No, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You, you know, Games Master or you know, bad influence is almost replicated with, with YouTube. Is you, you if if you're a fan of, you know, sensible software or something like that, and you want to know everything about it. There's, there's probably 10 videos all, all about it. If you're into the Amiga, you watch Dan's videos. And there's, there's so much out there, which you can, I think you hit a nail on the head. You can hyper-specialize on, you know, what you're interested in. And if you want to see the, you know, the history of an old football team, it, it's, it's all on there. Exactly, yeah. I mean, in, these kind of, um, in these well-produced kind of videos that look like TV shows, like, uh, you know, you've got digitized yeah. of the show that looks like it could be, you know, a, a broadcast television show. Well, yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, nostalgia nerd, you know, he's got re great looking stuff and yeah. you know, they're also but they're, they're good, also good presenters. They they they're just as good as a professional presenter would have been in like, you know, in the 90s do on a video game show. Um yeah, so, probably yeah, better they, in some regards because a lot of those guys back then were hired, you know, for 
their presentation ability, but knew nothing about games. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Uh, who was it you had on from Bad Influence? Andy uh, Craig. Andy yeah, Craig, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and you, he, he was a lovely guy, but yeah, he was hired because he did Saturday morning kids TV. You know, he wasn't a video gamer. Yeah, he was quite He was quite happy to admit that as well. And he said, yeah. oh, I've got all this free stuff and I've got free game gears and everything. But I wasn't interested in them, really. I was like, oh, God, I, mean, I wish I was doing that. <laughs> I would have killed for a free money game gear. You know, I had to wait till Christmas to get mine, you know. So. But you see a lot of, a lot of people now who, who you watch on YouTube they could easily be taken out of their bedroom, sort of making these videos where they edit them, they research them, they do everything, and they could be put onto sort of tomorrow's world 15 years ago and then them being, you know, national icons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the pro- easily. Clint on uh, Review Tech USA, or Review Tech USA, <laughs> LGR. Actually, mm. Review Tech USA is good as well. Um, he's, got a, he's got a great voice, you know, he, he looks nerdy, so it's kind of that has an appeal, you know. Um, and I think I think it made a good point there as well that these guys are producing and putting together their own videos. I mean, in television, that would be a job for about twenty people. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the point is, you don't need a show. I mean, we had Go Eight Bit, um, which is not really a show. You just watch to sort of learn about video games. It's kind of a you know an irreverent kind of. Well, it's a quiz show. It was good. Mm-hmm. I didn't mind it, but like you said, it was. Um, they'd have a get. They'd have a get, some of the get, some of the permanent people on it were actually into video games. And pretty much every week there'd be a guest, and they'd always ask them, "What's your favourite game?" And they'd be like, "Oh yeah, Fruit Ninja," or mm. something. You know, <laughs> and people like us, you know, we probably shouldn't because it's still a mm. game. But and we sort of roll our eyes, and we kind of want to say, "Oh yeah, you know, Metal Gear Solid," you know, or something. It's like um, they probably could find people like that if they really wanted. But um, celebs, you know, um, I think you're less likely to find people that are, you know, like us, as you know, most Simon Pegg or something. But you know what I mean, and sort of. The, the 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 sort of level that they're able to recruit um, people from you're not really going to get many of them um, yeah and the people on those panels it's the same ones you get on the Vigant News for you and eight out of ten cats it's like yeah. the same comedians isn't it are on these panel shows yeah. all the time it's kind of by accident if they're into games isn't it it's yeah. not you know um, so I think the thing we really should kick off with uh, because I think we all need to make a video where the thumbnail says, I'm cancelling my PlayStation Classic order where we've got a big grumpy face (laughs) on. Because that's that's real. That's kind of all the rage uh, of the last couple of weeks. But it's the PlayStation Classic. Um, So we're not, you know, it's not a new product, but we're just now talking about it because it's been announced. Uh, We've talked about it prior on on our podcast and you've done it on yours as well. Um, Also, the big micro console craze that we've got at the moment. I'm kind of mixed on on them. Um, when it comes to like the Nintendo ones, I can totally understand why they're really awesome. But for people like us, um, although I do actually have a SNES Classic, so I kind of wanted to just mess with it and see what I could do with it. And ha- after jailbreak breaking it, hack shit and all that, um, I've got a, you know my my actual Super Nintendo. I've got a flash cart in it. Uh, my NES, uh, I've got a flash cart in that. So I don't really get any of the benefit really. Um, a little bit more with the SNES Mini because it could do some of the games that the SNES flash cart can't. But I could talk about this as well in a minute. That has kind of been negated literally this week, uh, funnily enough. But yeah, um, then not really anything that appeals to me. What about you guys, Dan? Are you Have you got any of these micro consoles? Uh, I haven't actually. I mean, again, kind of like you said, Dan, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there that I'm not really sure that they're aimed at people like us, you know, that are into yeah. retro gaming. I think they're more the, the casual person who may have owned a PlayStation or a SNES, you know, 25 years ago. And then they'll, they'll be in Asda one night doing the shopping and spot one, or it'll be a birthday or Christmas yeah. and we'll get one then for a bit of nostalgia. But again, like you, I mean, I've got all the original systems and I've looked at the classics and I'm like, well, you know, I've got a SNES with an EverDrive and I've got a chipped PlayStation 1 that I can just download games for and play them on the original hardware. And given the choice, I'd always rather play the original hardware. Exactly, yeah. 100%. I mean, they're great for the pads, actually, funnily yeah. enough, because now you've got the 8-bit, though, boards that you can put into a SNES Classic Mini Controller or a NES Classic Mini Controller, which means you can use those pads now on the on an original Super Nintendo. Uh, I've got, um, I, just, I actually have a Super Famicom, but I've got like a Bluetooth receiver on that, the 8-bit, though, one. I actually got uh, a loose Super Famicom Classic Mini, the Japanese SNES Classic Mini. I've got one, I've got a loose controller, uh, and I put this board in it, and um, it works perfectly with my Super Famicom. So I've got a brand new 
uh, replica. Well, it's not even replica. It's kind of it's actually the controller, really, uh, um, isn't it? Um, that, that, that I use on that as opposed to a you know a twenty plus year old, you know, covered <laughs> in sauce and like sweaty hands and everything, battered over that amount of time controller. So they cheese lots its fingers. Oh yeah, chapel <laughs> cakes, uh, for all the disgusting things. Um, so yeah, they're great for that. Uh, but yeah, but Stu, have you got any of these things? Do you interest well, in? I've got, I've got a Super Nintendo Mini, but. You made an interesting point, actually, probably, I don't know, a few months ago when we were first talking about the PlayStation Mini. And you said, oh, God, what they're doing, they're just getting the old Vita TV boxes. Exactly, and just, yeah. Really yeah. Repurposing in them. Yeah. And I thought, oh, God, yeah, Trevor's here right now. But I don't think they have. It would have made sense, yeah, to put a, it, a Vita it, TV in a PlayStation 1 shell. Yeah, and a couple of USB ports on the front. Yeah. And yeah. You know, that might be the basis of it. But the PlayStation Vita was great for playing PlayStation 1 games. You could go into the store, you yeah. could buy loads of games for three, four pounds each, yep. and it, it, it cost you, you know, barely anything. And I thought, oh, yeah, this refurbishing that, you know, in a few weeks they'll announce it'll have Wi Fi and, oh, you can buy more games. But I don't think they've done that. And they've, they've so missed, you know, missed the mark. With, with the PlayStation Mini, because half the games uh, are, are the PAL versions, which will run, you know, 17% slower. and Bizarre, have yeah. Borders round, and th there's all these sort of mistakes that they've made with it. And then, you know, don't get me started on, on the choice of games. And, you know, there's some absolute classics on there. Final Fantasy VII, Metal Gear Solid, uh, Tekken 3, Ridge Racer 4. But then they've missed out so many good games. And, you know, the Crash Bandicoots, the, you know, the Spyros, uh, Gran Turismo. And so I, I don't know if they're planning to do a, um, a PlayStation Classic version 2 in a year's time, and which will have a, you know, a volume 2, which will have 20 different games on, and that's their... Maybe their plan. I, I'm. I'm not quite sure, really. I think you're right there. That, that's remarkable that they haven't. None of these consoles have done it yet, though. Even the Nintendo ones. I mean, they've got you know an online e-store. I can't understand why the. I mean, people have hacked them, so there is room to put you know extra stuff on there. Exactly. It baffles me why they don't just have a cheap little Wi-Fi chip in there, and then they can sell you more games that you can download, even on your own SD card. It's like such a yeah. bizarre decision and such a you know a missed opportunity for them. I think. Yeah, oh, it's it's a hundred percent because yeah. I think with the PlayStation Classic or PlayStation One Classic Mini, uh, whatever you want to call it, is that that's ninety pounds. That that doesn't feel like the original NES Mini when that came out. That's forty nine ninety nine. That's something you'll go, oh yeah, my brother will like that. I'll grab that for his uh, birthday. But the actual, you know, the PlayStation Mini, you're probably thinking, oh, actually, you know, it's a little bit more money, so you can afford to put these extra chips in to. And, and then they'll have an old whole ecosystem where people will be buying it and then they'll be going, oh, okay, yeah, I'll get a few more games for it. I've got a, f a few friends coming around. We'll grab a couple of games off the online store and there'll be a constant, you know, sort of marketplace there. But It makes no sense. I mean, they've already got uh, a bit of hardware that they've made, uh, the PlayStation TV. And it's not, okay, it's not the latest and greatest, but if you're just using it for PS1 games, it doesn't need to be. So the R&D for that is all done. All you've got to do really is just rejig the OS to maybe just lock down some of the features so it maybe just does PS1. You've got Wi Fi in that thing already. You've only got to put it in a shell that you can fit the board that looks like a PS1 case with the USB. And and yeah, um, maybe you could maybe you take the Bluetooth out so you can have wired PS1 replica controllers or you could leave that in so someone can say, oh, sorry, I'll get my BS3 controller working on it. Um, and that probably won't cost any more than what they're charging because the the the, the PS TV was what was it hundred quid? They were getting they were getting rid of fifty, weren't they? Weren't they a couple of years ago? Mm. Um, they've actually gone up again, weirdly enough. I was trying to grab one, but they're like about hundred quid again now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just why they didn't use that. Sony are the kings of like like um, you know making official backwards compatible and emulated um you know MacGuffins that will run their old hardware. I mean, the PSP could run PS One games. It was helped because it had um, the P the PSP CPU was a, a newer version of the PS ones, um, so it was it's actually partial at em emulation, but it still ran perfectly. The PS three, there's no PS one hardware in a PS three at all. That is all software. 
mm. um, that they wrote themselves to run PS1 games, and they all 99% of them run perfectly. So it's just bizarre that they would drop they would drop the ball so badly. And yeah, the Vita could run PS1 games. Um, can you get PS1 classics on the PS4? Actually, I'm not sure you can. I think um, they do them like you, you buy them as a pack that's got the emulator built in. So there's some PS2 stuff on there as well, isn't there? Yeah. 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 I mean, pers- I don't bother buying them personally because I just use my actual – well, I've got to just run those the discs that I've still got on a PS3. Um, but, yeah, it's just it's just bizarre. Are you still going to – you guys going to get one, though, Dan? Are you going to – did you pre-order one or are you going to wait to see what happens when it gets reviewed? No, again, I mean, from like you know, from my perspective, I'm kind of like you. I, I'd be interested in it if I can hack it or do something cool with it. That would be kind of be the perspective I'd like to come from. You know, what else yeah. can I do with this hardware? But yeah. I mean, the games list I've got all them on my PlayStation that I'm looking at in front of me right now. Anyway, so yeah, yeah there's no real need for me to go out and spend ninety quid on a a little system that could do exactly what this one here can. Yeah, I mean, I might go go for it again. It'll be for like like same as you, Dan. I mean, I, I would hope that someone's going to hack it. I'll probably yeah. fill around with the emulator and get the emulator running perfectly, and then they'll make a way we can stick ISOs on it. That'd be quite quite cool then, mm. um, and maybe put a bit more storage in it, and uh, that, that would make it better than what what you get by default. But um, I'm not, I haven't pre-ordered it. Um, I'm going to see how I feel about it, and you know, maybe closer to Christmas. But um, what about you, Stu? Are you going to? Well, I, you know, I did pre-order it, and then I. Angrily, cancel. I actually watched uh, sort of Metal <laughs> Jesus's video on it, and all oh, right, yeah. I thought, well, if he's going to cancel it, you know, I'll always do what he says. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I, I cancelled it. All um, oh, right, but it was more because I was actually thinking about Christmas and got a lot of things I have to, you know, you have to buy, and you know, you go away and and, and things like that. So I'm saying Metal Jesus was the reason, but in reality, it's more life's taken over a little bit and. Uh, Get a PlayStation yeah. TV for hundred quid. There you go. You got yourself the perfect PS One. Uh, yeah, you probably get it for less than that, surely. I, I saw PlayStation Two. I think in um, in a in a shop the other day for fifteen quid. So, yeah, there you go. It's a bargain for that machine. Really is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, but I mean, if, if they had the the downloadable option, though, it would. I mean, I, I saw his video as well, and yeah, there are people that are outraged. Like it hasn't got Tomb Raider on it. No Crash Bandicoot. I mean, if they give you the option to buy those games for like five to ten pounds and it would it would sell into all the haters really wouldn't it well it obviously it's, it's taken its lead from the the nez classic and the, and the snes classic and, and they hold the classic title because you know every great first party game and a good few others are on there and and you could argue that oh god it hasn't got this game on or it hasn't got that one but for the nez classic it's really got all of the big games on there it generally is the classic. And the, the, the same for the SNES. It's really got all of the sl- classic games on there. You know, there's a few more you could, could be added. But when it comes to the, the PlayStation, there are just so, so many gaps in there. And, and they put, you know, why they've got t- Battle Arena Toshinden, the first one, on there. And they've got Tekken 3, which is, is an absolutely amazing game. But then they put Battle Arena Toshinden. Yeah, I mean, you could basically well, say well, the PS1 has the greatest library of that generation of consoles. Mm, okay, there's the old yeah. UN64 games that are obviously exclusive that are brilliant. Uh, the Saturn's got a handful, of, but generally, I mean, they don't hold a candle to the PlayStation 1. I mean, it's got it's well nearly 2,000 games, I think, it ended up getting in the end. Mm. And, um, the, the, there's so many ex- amazing games. I mean, Prapper the Rapper isn't on it. Um, no, Gran Turismo. Like yeah, wipe, wipe out missing. I was shocked by. Yeah, wipe out. No, no, no. Wipe no, out. Crash, Crash Bandicoot. Spyro. You know. Spyro. Uh, Tomb, Tomb Raider. Raider. Um, I think I've already said it, but Gran Turismo. Why hasn't got analog sticks? Um, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the dual. I mean, a lot of people say, well, you know, it, it, when it came out, it had like uh, the, 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 you know, the, the regular controller that had enough sticks, but it has got games on it that, that support that. Ridge Racer Type Four. We used the analog sticks. Um, and to be honest, when it came out, it kind of became the default controller pretty quick. Didn't exactly, it? yeah. 1998, I think, beginning of eight, of, of 98. Um, it's got games like um, Rainbow Six, the original Rainbow Six. You're playing that with, with a, a digital controller. Honestly, I could not imagine anyone... It's horrendous anyway. Memories. Well, yeah. they have fond memories of it, but actually picking up that controller and thinking, oh, yeah, this feels good. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to no. put an FPS on it, you're probably Doom. 
because mm. the, the PlayStation One is the best version of Doom outside the PC. Well, Easy, not counting yeah. like obviously the 360 version and stuff. Like in terms of when it was out, when in, in the mid 90s, the PS One version was the best version. I people say all oh, the Jaguar version was good, but I think the PlayStation One version is because it's uh, it's got the frame rate's awesome. It's just very dark. Well, it's quite dark. You have to turn the brightness up on your telly. You better play it, but. Um, mm. That you haven't got to worry about that. It's just left, forward, right, you know, and that's it. And um, that would be perfect. Um, obviously, you might have guessed there's probably licensing things. No football game as well. No FIFA 98. Again, probably licensing. But that's you, what's really pissed you off, isn't it, Trev? International <laughs> soccer. You know, you got to have a bit of that on there. All everything was fake in that anyway. So I suppose they could get away with that. Um, yeah, it's just, um, it's just. Yeah, they could have made it so much better. I mean, obviously, the whole thing where it can't connect to a store, obviously, that's not a hardware issue because, like like Dan was saying, like a Wi-Fi chip is like – I don't even think you have to ask for one these days, do you, in any kind of, like, you know, micro, you know, sort of motherboard-type device like a Raspberry Pi. It's just such a, it's such a basic thing to implement. So it's not the hardware. I think they just didn't want to bother developing um, an operating system that would have to support connecting to a store. Hmm. I don't know how much work that is. I don't think it's a lot. Um, you think you'd think they've already done it, wouldn't you? So many yeah. times. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Can you shoe or just shoot like I said, just shoehorn the Vita OS in it and maybe lock some of it down or something? I don't really know, you know. Um, it's just weird. I mean, if they included all of I mean, they could have included the same games that, that were included in the same screwed position that they're in. But if it just had Wi Fi and you could just connect to the store and maybe you could buy the analog st- pad as well separate perhaps because they want you to everyone is still putting like, oh, really you should include it but at least it's there i don't think anybody would have any arguments then would they if you could buy more games to add to yeah. it mm. um i don't think anybody would argue they'd be like well the games that you get with it are a bit crap but you can download you know this so and so for um but yeah they've just uh it's just the absolute minimum you know viable product is really what they've brought out and i can't see them you know, fixing it really. And you know, it encourages as well. It encourages people to hack it and then pirate the games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Sony consoles are just like the most hacked things ever, aren't they? The, <laughs> you know, the PS3. It's super easy to hack a PS3. The PSP was kind of like within a matter of seconds of it coming out in Japan. You could already jailbreak that, and um, there were, people would buy them because you could jailbreak them. I think most of its units were sold because people would just jailbreak them, not because they they, they like the games that were, you could play on it without messing with it. Um, although I like the games that you could play on it anyway. Um, and the Vita, you could do that as well. Um, yeah, so it's going to happen um, that someone's going to hack it. And maybe it'll make it worth buying then if you can load up ISOs. I think Digital Foundry, that says it's like got a 16 gig card in it. Uh, or RAM in it. I don't know if it's an actual SD card. I think it's like flash um, memory. So you're a mm. bit limited. I mean, to be honest, that's probably most of it's taken up, isn't it? I would think with the how many games they got twenty. Well, I was going to say, yeah, Final Fantasy. That's a four disc game, wasn't it? So that's, that's probably a gig. two or three gig. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this is probably the last of the micro consoles in terms of um, from the big the big ones. Just because the games immediately after that generation of consoles would just be far too complicated and large to just uh, make a cheap little trinket of a device. You can't see Microsoft doing an original Xbox Mini, can you? Oh, God, no. <laughs> no. Philips CDI Mini. <laughs> God, that would be great. <laughs> oh, man, I, I, love to, I love to see that. I'll be up for that. <laughs> I'll, I'll be in line for that. I'll be in line for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I would actually buy one of those out of interest. <laughs> yeah. I totally would as well. Well, but me and Stu, I mean, we, we speculated a few months ago that if there was going to be one coming out, it would be a Game Boy classic. Yeah. Because um, that's the obvious one to me. Um, I think before an N64, well, apparently we're not getting one anyway. I don't think we would. I don't, I don't really think we would anyway. Um, but I think a Game Boy Mini, in fact, you could have it as just make a Game Boy Pocket size thing. I think you could really go smaller than that because it would be too difficult, to be too small to play. Um, with this, with probably a screen that's backlit, it doesn't have to be color particularly. You probably, I guess you could. I don't think you could probably get a black and white display. I think they would have to, because no one makes those. You'd have to sort of get sort of a normal display, um, and it will just do Game Boy Color and original and um, or or in, in one device loaded with thirty games. There's absolutely the library is insane, and that will sell like if, if it was sixty quid, 
that would that would sell like mental. It might it, it might sell the most out of all of them. To be honest, I mean the I Game Boy. Would, yeah. Yeah, in, in this country, the Game Boy was the first popular Nintendo device. Um, the NES wasn't popular here. Um, I still, I still think Nintendo would rather sell you a Switch though and uh, let you buy the games on there. Oh yeah, drip feed yeah. them to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that'll be a, it. May be a year's time when they start doing SNES and N sixty four and Game Boy. Yeah. That'll become a really good prospect. The online. Um, I mean, if it only gets to the level that maybe the virtual console has on the Wii U. When you, I mean, it's still not as good as the original. Well, if you got to the original Wii, I mean, God, how many games ultimately came out on that? About a thousand or something, perhaps. Um, if you got that many games included with the Switch Online, that would be a no-brainer then, wouldn't it? Even if you never want to do the on online game, you just want to play old games. I would pay £4 a month to do that. <laughs> Yeah, and those NES games run really well on it, but like you said, there's there's not many. There's only about like one twenty on there or something at the moment. Yeah, and it's missing like lots, like Kirby's so Adventure. They do, they do a know. few more each month. Like this month, uh, I think Metroid and uh, or something, and like yeah, I'll say Twin B came out as well. Yeah, so no I, Castlevania I, though, no no Castlevania, um, no yeah. no Kirby's Adventure, no. Con I, I think we, we look back in a year. And we'll go, oh, actually, yeah, it's good, it's good value. There's loads of games on here. But at the moment, I mean, I mean, I, I signed up for it, but, you, you know, I can't say I've got my money's worth yet. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've signed up for it. But I do play the NES games that are on there. But at the same time, I'm thinking, I could just play this on my actual NES. <laughs> and that's got <laughs> the EverDrive on the SNES has got a save state thing on that. So I'm not really getting extra functionality from playing it on a well, it's it through HDMI, I guess, and I can take it I can take it with me. That's kind of where the extra functionality is. But um yeah, it's it's it'll get better though. Um but it might just take a few years. Um I think they probably really um they had to release some kind of an online service. And um maybe they would have been happier waiting a year till they could build up a library of games and then releasing it, but um they didn't want to get too far behind. But they're still behind people that I mean Xbox Live was a thing in two thousand and four and it was doing a lot of the stuff it was doing more stuff than the Switch did in two thousand and four and Nintendo still haven't caught up to that. It's just they just can't they can't do it. <laughs> yeah, they're not good at online. No. Uh, I mean it's they just get it's just the absolute bare minimum. I mean, I, I, I and I don't get the impression that that's a lot of people say, oh yeah, but Nintendo people that are Nintendo into Nintendo, they're not into like online gaming or Smash and things like that. It's a necessity, isn't it? And Splatoon. So yeah, it's kind of an argument that I'm not sure about. But anyway, micro consoles basically were saying crap. Yeah. <laughs> well, around. some of them are all right. The Nintendo <laughs> ones are good. Yeah, hopefully yeah, that yeah. Uh, classic Amiga. Classic yeah, Amiga Mini. Awesome. Anyway, talking about Amiga, Amiga Classics. Um, in well, actually, if you hold week. your horses, hold your horses on that. I've got one more bit of news. That, oh, uh, more news. Go Nintendo ahead. Nintendo people are being into. So, if you've got, so if you guys, you have you got flashcards for your uh, Super Nintendo? Yeah, I got the EverDrive. You got the EverDrive, Stu. What have you got? I, I haven't. I have for for my NES. I bought myself a uh, cart with all the games on from AliExpress. So you're in the market potentially for some kind of a thing that will let you do lots certainly of them, but you haven't, the SNES, yeah, so you haven't taken the plunge but, yet. But the problem with the, the SNES cartridges, they yeah. just don't play all of the games. So what do you well, so, so 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 what do you want to clarify that? So what exactly is the issue there then? Well the problem is I'm leading you into something here. Uh, <laughs> they don't <laughs> play a lot of the, the games for the specialist chips. So I, I would never yeah. buy one until they play all the games with the specialist chips, okay. such as uh, the Super FX games, or I, I want to say things one. like Mario's yeah. uh, RPG, stuff like that. SA1, yes, is another one. Uh, so, yes, yeah. yeah, so what we're talking about is basically the Super Nintendo, um, to make up for the very slow CPU that it had inside it, which basically meant anything beyond a 2D platformer. Well, could be a bit or a, you know a beat em up or something, and not nothing more extravagant. It would struggle to do it. Um, so Nintendo would shove support chips into the cartridges that would basically be accelerators, like we have graphics cards now. Basically, like like shoving graphics cards into the cartridge to help it out to process more complex stuff. And a lot of the there's actually a surprisingly high amount of games that used these. The issue now is when you have a flash cart. You can't play those games. You can only really play, certainly on like a Super EverDrive, you can only play 
uh, the games that don't use any special chips. Although some of them have the DSP chip in them, yeah. uh, which some games use. So, Dan, have you got one? What flash card have you got for the snares? No, mine's one of the earlier ones. Um, I've probably had it about five, six years now. So, I mean, yeah. when I first got it, I was that, I didn't realise it didn't support Super FX. And first thing I tried to play was Mario Kart, and I was like, oh, <laughs> was it not working? So, I, I got yeah. to go out and buy the Super FX games on you know actual cartridges. But yeah, that was a bit um, bit annoying when I first got it. It's a funny one, isn't it? Because no one thinks of Mario Kart, but that does actually have a support chip in it, the DSP yeah. chip. Um, so even some of those common games uh, had chips in them. But there is a more expensive flash car that I was able to get my hands on a couple of years ago called an SD2 SNES, which has an FPGA in it. And that FPGA can be flashed, so it can uh, basically pretend to be a support chip. It can run – It can. Uh, it's not a sort of hardware emulation where it can be um, – the chip can be programmed to uh, recreate uh, another chip. Um, so it could be um, – originally, it was only able to do DSP and a couple of other chips like the CX4 – and a few other special chips that some SNES games used, but there wasn't any Super FX, and there wasn't any SA1, uh, and there wasn't a SDD one. So Super FX is Star Fox and Super Mario World 2 and Doom. Uh, all of those used the Super FX. So, yeah, you're already thinking, oh, my God, those are my favorite games. I can't even play those then. I've got to go and get the originals. Uh, and then there was the um, SA1, Super Mario RPG, Stu, that you mentioned, uses that. A lot of those Kirby games like Kirby Superstar and Kirby's Fun Pack, they used SA1. And then finally, there was the SDD one, which only had two games, uh, Street Fighter Round for Two, which is a game I really like on the Super Nintendo, and uh, Star Ocean, I think. Um, Trev, so, I thought you had an STD. So, so <laughs> <laughs> not STD. Uh, but, <laughs> <What was it? laughs> so SD the SD1. The SD snares. Oh, um, the SD to SNES, so the, uh, the, 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 over the years, um, well, it came out in 2011, I think, the cartridge originally. Um, mm. um, the guys that sort of made it, um, they've been trying to, like, um, they've hinted that they'll be able to support more chips in the future, but they weren't sure if the FPGA in there could handle uh, anything beyond what, what's already on there. But in the last couple of months, um, they managed to add um, like a chap called Red Guy, uh, who just took it upon himself to get Super FX working. And he did it. So now you can play all the Super FX games on the SD to SNES. Um, and then literally last week, uh, someone got SDD1. I think it's called Magno is the name of the programmer. Um, he got the SDD1 working. So that means Star Ocean and Street Fighter Round for 2 work. Uh, and actually just before that, I missed out. Uh, uh, I think um, the same guy that got the Super FX, Red Guy, he got... Um, he got the uh, SA1 chip working. So as of this week, the SD to SNES can run every Super Nintendo game released in Europe and, and the US. There's a handful of Japanese games that still don't work, literally about 10. Um, but apart from that, with the SD to SNES, you can now run every Super Nintendo game released in Europe and, and uh, the US, which is amazing news. Um, and I think also they added support for save states, so it now does what the Mega uh, the Mega EverDrive does, uh, the Mega Drive or Ever Mega EverDrive X7 to be ex exact. That adds save states. Um, the the ST to SNES has save states. Only downside with it is it is quite pricey. It's you're looking at about 160, 170 quid oh, to get an SD to SNES. Um, but this isn't like a new version that they've released. It's the same as the one that was in. If you got, if you bought it in 2011 when it came out, you've only got to put the latest firmware on it, and you'll suddenly have access to all of these games that it couldn't play up until this week. So basically, we now have the definitive Super Nintendo flash cart. Um, so I think it's Akari One was the chap that sort of built along with uh, Crix. Uh, they kind of collaborated to make the SD to snares. You can get the cart from. Crick's uh, shop. I think he's actually doing a Black, um, a Black Friday sale. Um, so if you guys want, I can hear frantic uh, sort of uh, <laughs> going Googling, yeah, keyboard sorry. and Google. Yes, I'll <laughs> buy one right now. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, probably a few people listening to the podcast might do this. So yeah, really, if you're a big Super Nintendo fan, a uh, great thing about it is it's, it's region free as well. So you can use it in a PAL Super Nintendo or a Super Famicom or an American. Make sure you get the right shell, though, if you're getting an American stance, because they're slightly different shells. Um, but, yeah, um, Stu, if you're worried that you're buying something that won't play all, all the SNES games, 
you can now go ahead and buy the. I can now play them all. Yeah, you can play all of them. I mean, I think these things are actually great, and uh, you know, I've. It's. I think me myself, sort of ten years ago, of course, oh, that's terrible. That's that's piracy. That is. Um, but actually, in reality, it's a lot of these games is you, you can't buy them even if you want them. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like as well. So, Get an and, SNES Classic or an SD to SNES and slap it in your old SNES. You've got something that's far more useful mm. than a SNES Classic, not you want to unlock it completely. But, yeah, I mean, also um, another great feature. Um, they also implement, I think Red Guy implemented a thing that uh, doubles the, the, the clock rate of the, uh, the, the speed of the Super oh. FX chip. So uh, games that have really terrible frame rates, they actually run at, uh, the, the, you get much better frame rates now. You can run them at double the speed. It's something like Doom. Which was like you know it was really difficult to play because it was so slow because of the frame rate was so low, it was borderline playable. Now you can you can uh, dial up the speed on the FX chip on the sort of emulated FX chip in the FPGA, and um, it it runs a hell of a lot smoother now. Um, so Dan, yeah, you get you you suck the the. the Tapping one on the keyboard, are you, you, you going to be grabbing yourself one of those now? Yeah, well, I was looking and wondering whether I could update the firmware on mine, but I've got a feeling mine may be a little bit too old. But then, I mean, the price I don't think is too bad. I mean, I, I did get people commenting on my, I did a, a video about the Super Nintendo EverDrive a yeah. few years ago, and you get a lot of people going, oh, it's too expensive. But if you think the cost of buying one of these, I mean, you're probably only talking about five, if that original games off eBay, and then oh, yeah, you're yeah. easily up to that price, maybe even less. Yeah, I mean, it's, I was looking on CEX the other day, and like Super Mario World is like eighty quid. Yeah, box, and I was like, that's that game. There's like millions of those, <laughs> even in the even you, you know, even in a battered old box, you know, with the dog-eared sort of corners and everything. They're still charging eighty quid. That's most of us, you know, a big chunk of an SD to snares already. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I would definitely recommend it. Um, so, yeah, check that out, guys. SD to SNES can now play every Super Nintendo game, chips and everything. So, yeah, great bit of news for the Super Nintendo scene there. Great for translations as well of games that never came out. You can run play the, the translated version of Japanese exclusive games. But anyway, as Stu nearly segued us into... Into uh, uh, Amiga. Now, me and Trevor have been having... Um, this is Dan, this is for you, and we want to know your opinion. We've been having sort of a bit of a debate where we actually tend to agree with each other is the 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 amiga and you get a lot of these sort of these vampire two cards and these other bits and pieces you put into them to give them amazing superpowers now what we're saying is that well actually um you, you're not really got an amiga you've got sort of an amiga in a box with with another card but it's it's the card that's doing everything and so we're actually saying well Arguably, that they're, they're not Amigas anymore. You, you should be having a, you know, if, if you want to uh, make your Amiga better, is is have some sort of, you know, a Blizzard card in there, you know, put yourself 16 uh, megabytes of RAM, get yourself an IDE hard drive. And, and I think people are sort of almost ruining their Amigas by having and these vampire cards in there and WHD load, because that, that's not what you originally had in the day. and. I can, so, I can see where it's coming from. Um, hmm. I mean, I've, got, I've got one of the vampires in an Amiga 600. And I mean, with it, you can either go the whole hog and like, you know, replace the Amiga's graphics and have a HDMI output, or you can just use it as kind of a quick accelerator, but yeah. still use the Amiga's display output and onboard audio and everything. So, but I, I do get where you're coming from. I mean, it's kind of, especially with the, the newer version, like the version four that's coming out with the AGA core and everything on it. I mean, essentially, you're, you're only really using your Amiga's keyboard and mouse really <laughs> so you know the the vampire is doing everything else really i think that that's what we're sort of really getting at and yeah. you know personally my, my honest opinion is I, I actually sort of think they're quite good hmm. um because you, you can do so much with them and um you know they breathe new life into in into the amigas and things hmm. and you know no one wants to you know spend 500 pounds on, on a graphics card where you could get this this extra board that can you know is, is, is maybe 150 pounds and in all honesty it does so much more and it's probably a lot more reliable but then it comes back to well actually the question is are you actually playing an amiga yeah i mean i the way i look at it is if that would had to come out 20 years ago i'd have you know <laughs> i'd have snapped someone's arm off to get hold of one it was exactly <laughs> that's kind of what we all dreamed about having and i think it's um it's kind of aimed at a different audience really i mean it's i've, I've got a lot of amigas set up here 
mm. at the moment i'm using a i've got a cd32 with one of the um terrible fire expansions in there which um, gives you about eight, eight megabytes of memory and you've got onboard ide and then you can put a compact flash card in there have it all loaded up with whg load for the classic stuff and then i've got my vampirized amiga 600 i've got a 4000 here as well i've got a 500 for like you know the really old school games so i think it's kind of because the amiga was around for so long and there's that many different models uh, you know it's quite quite varied you need a few systems to really get all eras of it i think that's a bloody annoying thing isn't it because yeah. um i've gone a bit I mean, I've had my uh, my my original Mega was a five hundred. That was the only one I really had. <coughs> and as I got older, and I had you know the, the money to do it, um, like like now I've got I've got CD thirty two, I've got twelve hundred, I've got a six hundred, and I've got a five a five hundred. But the thing is, now I now want to get those all boosted up to the best that I can get them. Um, <laughs> yeah, got, it's a hobby. Yeah, yeah. My twelve hundred, I've got a uh, yeah, one of the individual computers uh, accelerators, and uh, put an O three O in that. And that's great, you know. It makes it just like uh, opens up a whole world with WHD load. You can play every single Amiga game, and they run better than they ever did, you know, when you know, when the twelve hundred was out originally. Um, and because um, I've now got a six hundred, um, I'm looking to get an accelerator for that. Um, I'm thinking about getting Empire Trove. Well, one they're kind of hard to get. There's only they're only sort of in batches, aren't they, Dan? They're not sort of a readily available thing. Yeah, you've got to kind of go into a waiting list um, to get a hold of them. I think, you know, when the, when the version 4 comes out, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a pre-order list for that available now, but they're hoping to make more than they did last time, I think. Yeah, the thing that I sort of wasn't too sure about with the Vampire is you kind of need two monitors, don't you, or a monitor that has two inputs, because to run the classic stuff, you have to run that through like a VGA or, or an RGB. Yeah, the will jump... in there. So it's all going to come out yeah. of HDMI on the, on the new, newer model. On the new one, you just pipe through. You, you it just all gets piped through the HDMI. So yeah, yeah. That sounds like a, a much better solution. But at the moment, I mean, there's the uh, 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 there's a chap from Poland called called Lotharek or, or Lotharek. I'm butchering his sort of online handle, um, and he produces a lot of Amiga stuff. Um, he's made an accelerator card called the Furia um, for the Amiga 600. It's about it's about 100 pounds. It's actually quite reasonably priced. Um, you kind of have to open up your um, 600 and you sort of plonk it over the top of the CPU. Um, it kind of sort of like latches onto the sort of pins that are on the 6800 um, and sort of, you know, like again, kind of like a vampire kind of takes over. But it just puts basically an 020, um, uh, sort of like I think like 30 me- mem- 30-ish megahertz 020 with a load, lo- with a load of extra RAM. Um, so I think I'm probably going to do that and maybe put a bit of extra chip RAM in it. And uh, to be honest, that might end up being my main Amiga because it's so small. Um, it's so much easier to have in like, you know, a, a TV unit or just somewhere where you can sort of quickly grab it and plug it into your telly. The 1200 is a little bit more. Uh, well, that's fairly small um, as well. Uh, just a bit long, isn't it? It's an awkward size to put into like a unit or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the only thing with them as well. I mean, with any kind of an Amiga, you need to. Uh, well, there's also the CD32 is a bit better for that, but you kind of need somewhere where you can get to the keyboard. So you can't really just have it over the other side of the living room plugged into the telly. Um, oh, I think you can get chips you can plug into the... I know there's one for the 500. It's like a wireless keyboard chip, and you sort of plug it into somewhere on the 500, button the case back up. You can still, you can still use the original keyboard, and it will let you uh, put a USB dongle, and you can um, use a wireless keyboard on it. So in theory, you could um, sit away from your Amiga um, and then just use it um uh, you know from far away um so it can be in you can sort of couch game on, on an amiga but i haven't got anything like that so i have a separate little area for my amiga which is a bit more akin to what you would have had in the 90s where you had a monitor and a, a commodore 1080 whatever it was monitor sat on top of it and you'd be hunched o- o- over that for the for the night or something after you come home from school so that's the only slightly uh, you know thing that it isn't quite as convenient as it is on a console but the cd32 obviously that is a console really no. yeah i mean I've, I've got a little adapter for that i mean there are some games that do require the amiga's keyboard yeah and yeah. on the side of the cd32 you've got that aux port which actually is a keyboard input as well yeah but it's got a little um kind of a, a ps2 adapter that lets you plug a little mini ps2 keyboard into it Oh, cool. Which, um, which is great. I mean, I've got one of those micro keyboards with no numeric keypad. Just have that plugged in kind of down the side of the table. And if I need that lifted up, you know, if you need to press F10 on WHC load to quit and go into the next yeah. game or, you know, it's handy just to have one of those. But I've got a really small little keyboard with it. And again, I've got it connected up to a Philips um, CRT in my 
Ooh. little man down here and it's uh you know it feels like the way the games did back in the day but i think you, you made an interesting point there about wanting to upgrade all the machines and i kind of fell in the same trap i mean i got like a a bug standard amiga 500 a few years ago and then i was looking online i bought an 030 accelerator for it and an id interface and then i thought you know i'm just going to stop doing that and i'm going to keep this amiga 500 1.3 kickstart rom one megabyte of memory and that's it just like it was back in the day and did you buy cartoon classics recently yeah, i did yeah well i've got, yeah. I've got a 100 plus which is the, the first amiga that i got but i've also got like a, a really old scott it's actually a 1.2 amiga 500 that i got about three or five years ago and my 500 plus yeah. and the 500 i've kept in their original state you know if i want to play mm-hmm. games i've got to play them off the those noisy floppy disk drives that vibrate the table with that loud <laughs> yeah, just like, yeah. Oh, i remember them yeah, that I've kind of, I'm quite happy to keep as it is. I've got my first Amiga was a 500 plus, and it was actually also the cartoon classics. Yeah. I think I think they just switched the computers out, didn't they? It, it didn't say it didn't say on the box. Uh, <laughs> this is an Amiga 500 plus. It just says Amiga 500. I think they didn't. They couldn't be bothered to reprint the box. Uh, maybe they did late, but later on. But inside was a 500 plus. I was like, oh, cool. I think they ran out of a 500. That was the story. So they had to start putting them in a bit early. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> so you didn't know you were getting one, which is kind of cool. Damn. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, Dan, did you watch yep. the um, Angry Video Game Nerds uh, video on on the thirty two, uh, the Amiga CD thirty two? Oh yeah, that's been uh, been getting a lot of interesting <laughs> debate at the moment. I've, I've had about fifty people send me that video in the last week. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I I watched that. I, was, I downloaded. It. I watched it on the train into work, and and I was well. Actually, he he's given the machine a real hard time because. You, you know, you don't go and pick the you know the ten worst games on the system, and exactly, yeah. And then he he really slated it. In, in my opinion, you know, the Amiga twelve hundred was my you know fondest machine and some amazing games for it. And okay, the CD thirty two wasn't the most successful machine in 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 the world. But what what's your have you, have you seen the video and what's your opinion on it? Yeah, I mean the way I've, I've watched James Rolf since God, when he started like two thousand four five in a long time. Um, and I think a lot of people who I've who I've seen reacting to this video don't really know his character and what the show's about. I mean, you don't yeah. watch an AVGN video for a documentary style insight into a system. <laughs> you watch it because he's yeah. going to rip it to bits and he's going to slate it. And yeah. I, I actually think because he was he's a Nintendo gamer at heart, and yeah. he didn't have the nostalgia for the Amiga that we have, which can sometimes you know give you kind of a rose tinted view back on it. But I think looking at it from a pure console perspective, as he did with a fresh pair of eyes, I think it did actually make some very valid points. Um, yeah. You know, kind of the fact that, I mean, we all knew it back when the CD32 came out, that a lot of the games on there were just Amiga 500 games dumped onto a CD-ROM, and they they weren't enhanced to take advantage of a four-button controller. It was still up to jump, which uh, yeah, anyone yeah. who wanted a console, you know, you'd expect the games to be suited to the actual system they were on. And a lot of people were like, well, you should realize that they were Amiga 500 games, but then... The argument back is, well, this was sold as a console. You shouldn't have to look at where the games came from. They should be made to work with the hardware that you've got. Mm. Exactly, yeah. It was kind of the definition of shovelware, wasn't it? But it's also like it's a sort of a reflection of how the Americans view um, the Amiga. I mean, uh, Stu, we've talked about it before. Like There was that sort of flurry of documentaries about the Amiga that came out in the last sort of couple of years. Mm. And I watched them, and they're kind of a bit alien to me. Because they kind of they make the Amiga sound like it was this really niche product that had this tiny dedicated following that really love it when everybody else didn't lo- love it, and they were this they were the one person that they knew that used it in this very specific way. Doesn't mention really any of the big games uh, to any degree. Um, like I was watching, I can't remember which one it was, but Sensible Soccer got one really quick mention near the end, and I was like, that's that's not like the greatest Amiga game of all time. Uh, to me, I don't know what your guys' opinions is. Actually, no, sod it. It is the greatest Amiga game of all time. Um, and, yeah, it just didn't... Um, it was, like, cool, you know, and everything. Really well produced and everything. But um, it didn't reflect my experience of the Amiga, which was... I mean, it was tons of people had one. It was a swap disc with mates. Um, and it was a, just a mainstream... So, to what the NES is to Americans, the Amiga is to us, really. Um, that's kind of our Nintendo, kind of, you know. So yeah. if, if you go on YouTube and you're like, you know, you're someone that's maybe in their early 20s now or, or teens um, and you want to learn about the history of video games and you use YouTube to do it and you go on all the big American YouTubers, it's basically 80s equals Nintendo and then 90s yeah. equals Nintendo slash Sega with Sony killing everybody at the end. Um, 
Also, they won't really mention Commodore or Atari or, uh, well, certainly not after the mid '80s when you know, also when Atari, the Atari ST wasn't particularly popular in um, America. Also, in the in the UK, it was huge along with Amiga. Um, and I do think that's a shame as well because it's kind of like you're right there. And I I often get comments on some of my videos from, you know, maybe kids who are like 17, 18. They're like, "Well, this is interesting. I hadn't heard about this, and they want to find out more about it." But I mean, you guys are probably the same. I mean, when I was at yeah, school, yeah. Was, at first it was Commodore 64, Spectrum, and Amstrad, CPC, all the kids yeah. had. And then after that, it was Amigas, and you know, a few kids had Mega Drives and SNESs. But at my school, way more kids had Amiga 500s and than Mega Drives. Every everyone had an Amiga. That that's what you you know. I bought an Amiga because everyone had one. That that's what I always base my decisions on. On you, you know, everyone had a Spectrum, or there's more Spectrum games in boots. So that's what I'm going to buy. Then you know everyone had an Amiga, so that that's what I wanted, and it brings out an interesting question. Really, if the Amiga was as big as in in the US as it was in Europe and you know the UK, Germany, it, actually in America, you know it could potentially be as as big as Apple is today. Yeah, e- easily if it had the same. You yeah, know, everyone played all the same games on it, and and I don't. I, you know, someone's got to really look at the the Commodore marketing team in in America because every YouTuber from America goes. You know, they talk on on your show, Dan. They go, "Oh well, you know, the first machine I had was either an Apple II, everyone had an Apple II, or a Commodore sixty four. Yeah. Everyone speaks so fondly about the Commodore. Oh, the Commodore sixty four was absolutely amazing. And then they bought out this. Uh, Commodore Amiga, which was, you know, as good as a Mega Drive, if a hell of a lot better, was a computer, had so much RAM, could do absolutely everything, and somehow they managed to market it to absolutely no one except I mean, for people who wanted to make Babylon Five. Yeah, I mean, I mean if, I if, don't you know. at, if you look at 1985 and you look at um, the, the systems that were around then, and then the Amiga, the Amiga just absolutely crapped on everything. I mean, it was a point of leap, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Wise, um, I mean, the Macintosh was still black and white with no sound, a beep. You could do a beep and a few sound effects. The PC was, you know, four color CGA, maybe, maybe. Um, and it cost NBA. about three thousand pounds. About three thousand pounds. You had like uh, consoles of basically the NES, and that had just come out. The, the NES was like new, uh, and the Amiga had a proper sound chip that could make kind of things that sound sound effects that were real sounds. They sounded like real things. Music mm-hmm. that when I mean, everyone talks about how oh yeah, I remember when the Super Nintendo kite came out, like, the, like music sounded like real now, and it's like the, the Amiga was doing that like six years before. Uh, the Paula chip was like you know okay, it's missing a few channels, but um, you've only got to play um, SNES ports of um, Amiga games like Pinball Dreams, and the sound is close, but it's still not as good. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably why the Amiga was uh, gaming wise was able to last. Basically, I know everybody sort of says, "Well, Commodore went bankrupt in 1994, and that's it; it stopped." It didn't really. There were still games coming out for the Amiga. Uh, well, there still is to this day, really. But well, commercially, probably till about 1998, I still saw them in, in shops. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got things like Chaos Engine Two came out in like '96 or something, and like you know, Z Wolf and. Like Mortal Kombat Two and like things like that came out, um, but because of the the, the the custom chips in it um, and the sound chip and everything, it was able to stay toe to toe with the SNES and the Mega Drive, basically until the PlayStation took over from everything. Really, was when I don't mean like when it came out in nineteen ninety five. It was really not until ninety eight that it was like full on saturation point with the PlayStation. Um, so yeah, I mean it just. It was so advanced that it was able to last that that long. I mean, the Atari ST was pretty good when it came out, but the Amiga was just better, better and you know, completely. Um, I, I think Commodore America, though, that their big mistake was they. I think they saw the attack of the PC, which kind of it took off earlier in America. I mean, it was yeah. yeah the, I, I knew like maybe one guy who had a PC when I was at school. That's because his dad had it. It was like a an Amstrad three eight six. But yeah. I think it was a factor of they they cost thousands of pounds then, and. The Amiga was like, what, 400 quid by like 92 when I got mine? Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, whereas in America, though, the PC took over a lot earlier, I think. And I mean, Macintoshes, I didn't really see. I, I didn't see a Mac until I got to university, probably, really. You know, they just weren't common here. Yeah, the Mac was a funny one. I mean, I've debated with um, Stu about whether we should do like <laughs> like a, a gaming on, a, on, a, on an old Mac uh, episode, because I do actually have a few 90s Macs. And they're actually not bad. Um, 
because uh, they had pretty decent sound and colours when he got to the sort of early part of the 90s. Um, the Macintosh 2 is, re is actually really impressive because that came out in like 1987 after Jobs had left. And that just had amazing graphics. It could do like 16 million colours in, in 1987. Um, yeah. The graphics card cost about two grand. <laughs> uh, so you would so you get it with just the regular card, whatever that was that was in there then. And if you wanted, you could upgrade to a, a true color card in 1987 that had 16 million colors, and that was it. Was like cost more than the computer. Uh, but um, yeah, that's kind of an interesting platform because um, things like Secret of Monkey Island got like their own custom Mac version, and it was actually the, probably the best version of the game. You could, and Flashback and things like like that got um, a, a Macintosh versions. Very difficult to get hold of now um, because I think a lot less people use Macs in the 90s. Uh, certainly in the UK, it was uh, not many at all. I mean, now I see them all over the place. Um, but in, there, in those days, it was it was extremely – they were so expensive uh, as well. And I'm talking about when there were still fairly dull-looking beige boxes. Uh, yeah, the, the pre-jobs era before he came back. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Still very – I mean, a lot of people forget about that era, but they're still pretty good machines, the, the, the people that, at, that Apple made. And Johnny Ive was there before Steve Jobs came back. Um, I, would, I would occasionally play with them and, like, you know, if I went to, like, uh, Ryman's or somewhere, I'd often have them in randomly. <laughs> I'd, I'd yeah. play them. And an Apple Newton, maybe. But, I, yeah. like you said, it was so expensive. I just didn't know anyone that had a Mac until the turn of the, the millennium, really. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting because if, if you're into the sort of early 90s uh, – PC or computer gaming, probably is the best better word for it. Um, a Mac is quite an interesting option because you don't have to really worry about um, learn, knowing DOS because uh, there was never a DOS for the for the Mac Josh. It was always a, a, a GUI. So you know Doom and stuff like that. Um, if you've got a Mac that can run that particular, um, but basically you've got the classic Mac OS that will run anything pretty much all the way back to 1984. To get yourself a mid '90s Mac, and you can stick Doom in, and it'll just run off the disk straight away. And really, got to just double click on the icon. You might have to install it, but beyond that, there's no real finicky fiddling around with stuff like you would have to do with a PC. Uh, so, yeah. you know, like for the Mac version of Duke Nukem, you know, the uh, SimCity 2000, a lot of the big, the big PC games got a Mac version. It's a lot easier to get running on old Mac hardware than it is old PC ha hardware because there was no C um, command line to deal with. Um, but yeah, that's just if you're a weirdo like me who likes those weird niche ways of playing games that I've got about 10 other ways to play. Well, I have got a Power Mac G4 that I've got, you know, because that, that I've got OS 9 on that and that can run all the 68K stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I can play all those. And I've recently been messing around with the 486 PC as well. And I've mm. forgotten what a headache, like, you know, DOS DMA conflicts and all that oh, stuff God. is. It's, oh, God, it's, I've been going through hell with that recently. So I just had a nicer way of doing it. I'm trying to find a 486 PC. Is that something you picked up recently, or is it something you've always had lying around? Or about two weeks ago, actually. Yeah, so I've, oh, I've been cool. asking one for a while. And I found a nice, um, nice example of one. Unfortunately, and um, the guy that sent it to me didn't package it very well, so the case got um, smashed a bit in transit. But oh, dear. I've kind of fixed it up a bit again. I've got like an old mechanical IBM keyboard for it and stuff, and it's got a, bit, it's got a very, yeah. very noisy hard disk in there as well from like. It's funny. Trev, you say that they're, they're hard to find. There must be hundreds of thousands of um, PCs, four yeah. eight PCs, just sitting around in people's lofts. Um, the thing is, in the you've back got, of offices, the, the they're actually doing thing. nothing. But then, no one thinks they're worth anything to yeah. sell. Yeah, you've got you've got to zero in on a particular spec that you're after. Mm. That, that is the trouble. Um, so I, I've I've been looking for sort of a. A high-end four eight six, um, like oh, four eight six DX four, yeah, like, like a hundred megahertz, <laughs> yeah, like a DX four hundred megahertz, like sixteen mega RAM. Yeah. I don't really want a Pentium. I want to get that sweet spot. And it is remarkably hard to get a desktop. It's actually way easier to find laptops, actually, of that spec mm. for some reason. Um, like we've got a couple of old IBM ThinkPads that are four eight sixes, but they not but they haven't got sound cards. So and you can't add sound cards to those. So. You could play. I could put DOS games on them, and they'll run. They'll look okay visually, but um, there's no. It would be. It's the PC speaker. The beeping is the only sound you can get. You have to go about a year later from those from that era when they started putting sound hardware in them, um, sort of ninety five, ninety six. Uh, but to find um, like sort of four eight six, I nearly got one uh, not long ago. Someone was selling an IBM Aptiva, um, which was like a quite an expensive brand of piece when IBM were kind of. Um, it, 
yeah, that was sort of a mid '90s period where they were still producing P uh, PCs, and they kind of made kind of a luxury brand of them called Ap Aptiva. Um, and yeah, it was like a four eight six seventy five megahertz. It had still working fine. I'd Windows three point one, um, but they wanted to sell the printer, a monitor, and about ten other bits of big hardware with it. And I said, "Oh, can you?" I'm actually just after like literally the tower case. I've got the other bits. Are you able to sell me just that? And they're like, "No, I don't want to split it up." I was like, "All right." <laughs> But it's weird though because I, I've got like a, a Pentium three PC with Windows ninety eight on, which I you know use for like the the quakes and stuff and the yeah, CD games yeah. that came out in the late nineties. But again, like you, I wanted a three point one machine, yeah, uh, four eight six. I've got like an original Sound Blaster sixteen in there, a little VGA card. I've got a network card actually that came with it too, uh, Win cool. three point one. I just wanted kind of that kind of early nineties DOS era before like the Pentium came out. Yes. Yeah, and it's got a CD-ROM drive in there, so I mean, I installed in Carter the other day just to kind of bring back memories a bit. Of school. <laughs> oh, God, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but it has been hard to yeah. get that system in. I was I'm looking on eBay probably for about two years, and it, if you want to build your own, you could find all the parts. But I wanted just a nice assembled one that someone wasn't trying to charge like you know a grand for. Um, yeah, so people charge a lot, lot don't they? They've kind of caught on to the fact that people kind of have view that as a kind of a golden age. That sort yeah. of. 1990 to 96 7 period of the 486 people thought that it's now kind of a golden age i guess it obviously because we're talking about it like it's amazing which it was um so if anybody sort of you know has a pc that sits right in that seat sweet spot and they've got they're kind of savvy enough to know that oh people are after these now they just charge ridiculous pricing people charge like a thousand yeah like a grand for a you know, a 486 PC in good condition if you, if you want to buy one you've almost got to go down the route of not ebay Something like yeah, mate's got a, one. A job or, lot of computers yeah. on, on Gumtree. Yeah, take a little bit of a, a risk with it, and or you've got to look at a boot fair or an old office office sale or or, or, or something like that. You can't go down the eBay route or the forum route. You, you've you've kind of got to go um, a, a different route, and and you put honestly, I think you you get it for absolutely peanuts. You're probably right. I mean, I mean, it's bizarre because I've got computers in my sort of collection that, on paper, are rarer than any kind of a four eight six PC would have been. I've got like mm. a, I've got a PowerBook one hundred, which is the first ever Apple sort of laptop. Um, well, there was the there was one before that, but in terms of like a a, a notepad form factor, I, I've got that. You could pick those up on eBay, not too easily, but like they do come up. I've got an Apple II GS. Uh, which is um, quite a difficult computer to pick up, but I got one in with it's still in its box uh, with all the manuals. Um, I've got an Apple II, an Apple II Euro Plus. Uh, that was that was only about hundred quid, <laughs> and that's like a you know legendary computer, the Apple II. Um, and the, the, there wasn't, they weren't particularly pop popular in the UK. Um, I've got uh, I've got a few mid nineties Macs, and again, the Mac was a tiny tiny market share in the UK. Uh, I've had no no worries picking like any of them up, but uh, uh, like I said, that a sweet spot sort of four eight six DX uh, PC is uh, very very difficult, and I've, I've kind of given up for the time being. Probably want to get into the new year, I might try and get one. It's also finding the room for them as well. I mean, these things are huge. Um, I don't know what I'll put it. When I want to get one, I'll, I'll, Dan, I suppose that you're going to get a compact flash card in it and do all that sort of stuff. And uh, I think I'm going to leave the nice, noisy hard disk that's in there, isn't it? Because when I turn it <laughs> yeah. on, that, that's nostalgic when you hear that whirring up and that it's cranking away. And... Yeah. Then you going to fail. <laughs> yeah, I, I should really back it up because I don't have to reinstall Windows 3.1 again. Okay. But um, I, I think what what is probably to ex you know to explain why the, there's a bit of a scarcity of them now. I just think it's probably a case of people didn't really have the affinity for PCs as we did for like Amigas and uh, yeah, you, know, that's true. you, you yeah. get a new PC, you, you throw your old motherboard out and you might keep the case. Plus the generic off the shelf parts, aren't they? Yeah, that's right, people, yeah. They don't really care about them in the same way, I guess. That's my kind of theory. Tools. They're kind of appliances, weren't they? like a kettle almost, yeah. you know, so people didn't really think, oh, I'm going to put that back in its box and keep it in the, you know, keep it in nice and, Good Nick, whereas an Amiga kind of, you know, yeah. You, it, it, also, the fact that they were kind of uh, one, they were kind of in, there were particular closed units that they made th millions of that one unit. Um, I guess that means they're kind of easier to find, like an Amiga, uh, whereas a PC, it was so many different manufacturers and so many different specs that one particular spec in that particular case might have only been manufactured for six months. 
yeah. before a speed bumped version of it came out that was another six months. And that might explain why Macs are more common because, again, they were just one particular Mac was made for a year that was just this one unit. And it was just they just sold millions of that one unit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that would probably explain that. I mean, if you were going to say to someone, like, going back to the Amiga, I want to get, I want, I want to get into the Amiga. Um, I don't really know what to get. What would you suggest as sort of uh, an entry sort of level system sort of setup for someone? Well, I did do a video on this probably about 2011, which is ridiculously outdated. 2011? Now. Still video? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my answer in that video was an Amiga 1200, which I think would probably still be my answer. I think I'll um, agree with that, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I'd, I'd say, I mean, for anyone that wants to kind of explore the library first, the first thing I'd do is probably, you know, install UAE on your PC. Yeah. And have a little try. I mean, it's easy enough to find all the stuff online. And then if you if you enjoy it and you get the bug, I think the A1200, though, even though there are expansions available for the other Amigas, the 1200 is kind of a sweet spot that it will, with WHD load, it will let you run pretty much anything. And it's it's got an IDE interface built in, and it's got two megabytes of memory. You can get expansions for it if you want to put a bit more RAM in that are, you know, under, under 100 pounds. Yeah, I'll probably say I'll say that over a CD32 as well because you can't oh, yeah. tinker with that a bit more and you need to get the full Amiga experience. And there's a lot more A1200s out there. I mean, the CD32 is quite a, an expensive system to get hold of now, but I mean, the prices of them are going up every year. Um, but you can still get a decent A1200 for under 200 quid. I think I paid about 150 for mine a few years ago. So I never yeah. had one back in the day because I never had 400 quid and they never really went cheap. In the 90s did they it wasn't until like sort of in the 2000s that there were people were starting to flog them cheap because they well, just I moved got, on <laughs> i got two cd32s in 1995 for about 20 quid each oh wow, wow. yeah so that was obviously just That's after stunning. commodore had gone under and i don't think anyone really cared about them at that time i actually bought two of them so i used them as cd players just to play audio <laughs> right in my bedroom um, oh too, but yeah, I mean, I think yeah, what, 200 quid now for a loose one, isn't it? I, oh, think. Man, I was looking at about 400 quid on eBay this week. I think AVGN's video has got some interest. Oh. Yeah, so oh, there we go. Yeah, that after yeah. the YouTube effect. I mean, an Amiga 1200, even though I've noticed like a base one. I remember, Stu, you've been thinking about grabbing one and I sort of sent you an auction. Like, yeah. oh, this is what kind of you're up against, mate. Sorry. Uh, there was like one, didn't have any upgrades, but it was in really good nick. It was like 350 quid. Yeah, by the uh, original price, just, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. We're not accounting for inflation, I guess. Uh, but yeah, um, it's um, it didn't have any upgrades or anything on it. So if you were if you wanted to get it to the level that I've got mine, you, you're looking at another two, maybe hundred, hundred fifty quid on top of that for an accelerator and all uh, to really unlock sort of WHD load. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd agree. I mean, the six hundred isn't that far behind it now. It, it used to be sort of the, the redheaded stepchild, didn't it, of the Amiga family? But weirdly, because of the the hardware in it. Like the the IDE interface, yeah. It's actually I, kind I, of... I, I, I'd go with a six hundred over a five hundred if yeah. um, you yeah. know, you're getting into the Amiga. And again, you've got that um, PC card slot on the side as well. So if you want to add new stuff to it, you know, you can put a little um, combat flash card to SD adapter and then transfer files from your PC over to it. And there, you can get those for pennies. Those adapters. They're also because they're so small as well. Like we're talking yeah. about space um, issues, they're a lot smaller than a six hundred. And then a 1200, sorry, not, not height wise as well as, or width wise as well as um, height wise. So, yeah. Um, but again, you're a little bit limited because even if you did get an accelerator, not counting, I'm not talking about a vampire, just like that Furia one, for example, you're still missing out on some of the AGA games. And that's not a big deal, I suppose. I mean, how many actually are there? I mean, even. Yeah, there's only a handful worth playing, I think. I mean, some of the yeah. demos interest me a bit more, the AGA demos. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of them aren't actually like they're like the sort of games that are exclusive to AGA. It's literally like they're just like the game that, that has a 600 version. It's just got a few more colours. I think there may be like some like SimCity 2000 or like All New World of Lemmings, like Chaos Engine 2. I think maybe that might actually work on a 500. But yeah, I think they're the only ones that really are only AGA. Um, so yeah, I mean a 600 is a good option, but you would need to really get an accelerator straight away. Whereas a 1200, you could kind of get away with the base model and just an IDE. Well, you could get, you could just buy a bit of extra RAM and uh, get an SD card or a CF adapter. And that's like, what, 50 quid for sort of that, I would probably say together. Yeah, and I've, I've seen, I think Amiga could do like eight megabyte RAM expansions. You can put in the trapdoor for like about 60 quid, I, I want to say. So I yeah. mean, that will, that will let you run pretty much anything on WHD load. Yeah, and like, uh, so another like 10, 15 quid on top of that for the. 
compact flash interface and yeah you got yourself a pretty good setup and then maybe a, you know a bit later when you got a bit more money you can get an accelerator to get something like frontier elite 2 and things like that to run a little bit a little bit smoother but yeah i think that's a that'll be a good shout so there you go Stu. get hunting on a on a mega 1200 before the price goes up even more yeah <laughs> <laughs> right now it's going up now Stu. you need to get on it <laughs> no People on YouTube keep on talking about them. <laughs> and podcasts. And yeah, podcasts exactly. as well, yeah. Phantom. Phantom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, guys. Well, I think we've uh, covered the um, everything that we want to cover before we send our audience to sleep. Uh, so so thanks, Dan, again for coming on. Hopefully we won't make it uh, two years ago before the next time we get you on. Yeah, so let's not make it that long. Yeah. <laughs> Right, Stu, so where can you find us? Uh, you can find us, we're on YouTube, uh, under Console Shock, on iTunes, under Console Shock, uh, Stitcher, Console Shock, and we're on Twitter now, Console Shock. Um, but Dan, where can we find you, the Retro Hour? And Dan Wood, it, it, it's, it's spooky tech, isn't it? Uh, it used to be kooky tech, but I don't really use it anymore. It's just, yeah, Dan Wood on YouTube. I mean, my Dan Wood on YouTube, been, yeah. It's been a bit of a kind of cob website recently. My YouTube channel, I haven't done any videos for a couple of months, but I'm going to get back on that soon because I've been moving house and everything. Uh, uh, but yeah, the podcast, I mean, that comes out every Friday. So you're going to have a new backdrop. Yes, yeah, it's going to be a new room, yeah. So I might get some, uh, some surprise views when I hit <laughs> the camera up again in the next week or two. D- dare you put an Amiga in the living room? I did have a CD TV in the living oh room God. in my last place, but now it's, it's in my little. I've got a bigger man den in this place, so it, it's oh, all in here now. I've wow. only got my current gen stuff in the living room these days, which I uh, into there for hours of uh, hours a day and uh, play Amiga stuff. That sounds great, actually. I'll, I'll yeah. totally do that. <laughs> Wipe just slides food under the door every now and then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but also the podcast as well. We had the retro hour. That's every Friday. We've got a quiz coming up actually in our. Uh, in our Christmas episode, oh, I do, I do love you. you get your yeah. mates around and you all wear Christmas jumpers and uh, mince pies and mince pies. Again, so it was a lot. Uh, oh, good. good. Cool. Um, well, thanks again, Dan. Uh, check out uh, Dan's podcast, The Retro Hour, and also his YouTube channel as well. Um, Stu, don't get too excited about. Well, don't get an Amiga as soon as we get off this podcast, for God's sake. I oh, know. The podcast gets released. Man. It's going to go up. <laughs> All right, guys, well, thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you. See ya.